you know, for us, we've been uh, qualified for Champions League, which accelerates the beginning of next season as well. So yeah, I mean, it's 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 these are wonderful high class problems to have. That yeah, it turns out we have to do some work in the off season along with, uh, you know, winning the championship. I would I would say from my perspective, you know, yeah, there's work for the coaches to do. We had to revisit things and you know reflect on and do stuff like that. But it's really Garth and Chris and Sean Henderson and you know all the support guys that are, you know, planning for players and drafts and stuff like that. It's their busy time. I mean, for us, it's just a little bit of reflection. Yeah, we're starting to already plan preseason, how, how that's going to look, what that's going to look like. But those guys are the ones that are doing the lion's share of the work. And when you do reflect on and take some time to reflect on the season that has been and everything that you talked about a roller coaster ride a few weeks ago, you know, what, what stands out to you from the ride of this last you know, 12 months or so as, as the high points, the low points, the things you had to really kind of go through and overcome as, that stand out to you? Well, it ended on a high, started on a high, and then there was a lot of bumps in between. <laughs> I mean, when, when we do reflection, Jackson, so what, what I try and do is, you know, we, we try to get feedback from all the various uh, people at work and support us, from the equipment guys to the medical staff, the performance guys. We take their feedback, let them, you know, you know, even some of the bad things, some of the things they didn't like about us coaches so that we can always get better. Then we as a staff went through and, you know, kind of talked about what we felt went well and what training habits we liked and players that we liked and things to plan for young players. You know, we, we did a little something new this year. We're coming up with our top, you know, top 20 drills. So from all last year, what were the drills that we felt were really beneficial for specific situations? So we actually catalog those sessions. We film all of our sessions so it's out there. I mean, we know what we've done if we have to look for it, but this just gives us a better way to kind of manage what we felt we did well and what the players liked. So a lot of that type of work for us is, is kind of just standard practices. But I would also add one more thing to our plate. What I learned in 2016 to 2017 you know, because 2016 in many ways was a bit of a blur for me. And we ended up, you know, we, we won a championship. It was pretty cool and it was great. But then in 2017, it was like, okay, well, what do we do now? And, and, you know, and how do we approach things? And I've said this on record that I felt we started 2017 a little bit complacent. There was, you know, some of the players, we had just won. There was some big game. I don't want that to happen again. I want next year actually that all the departments, ourselves included, kind of drive the level of our organization a little higher. And that's important because that's something that I learned from 2016 to 2017. When you talk to the staff, I mean, you're asking them how can we be better and stuff. What have you learned about yourself that you can be better for 2019 just personally? And Garth, for you as well. Well, just to continue, not to hog up all the time, but it's just organizational skills. That's my, that's my number one Achilles heel. Can we get better organized? Can we do more with the defiance? And how do we structure trainings where pl their players are coming up to us? And do we have a clear plan for some of the young players that, that we're trying to develop? All of those organizational things are, are the things that I have to deal with. You mean, look, for us, you know, we've said already publicly we're going to try and win Champions League. Like, no one's ever done that before, and that's going to be really hard. And, and uh, we're, you know, eagerly embracing that challenge. And, um, you know, I think overall that might make us a little bit more conservative in some of our decision making uh, just in terms of um, you know guys who have done there and been there and done that for us I think are, are uh, we'll get the benefit of the doubt let's say um, but look long term we have to look at things like you know we have the oldest roster in the league and we had the fewest minutes played by players under the age of 23 so there has to be some balance there as well and, and you know again we, we said this all year long right we said we're at the mature point of our cycle we have our guys at their apex, at their primes. You know, all of our money is on the field right now. Um, and so we, we carried that through when we won. And, you know, this is, I think, a continuation of that if we go for Champions League in that context. Um, you know, and I think it's, it would be hubris of us, though, to, to not learn, have learned anything from Toronto's experience in uh, <coughs> 17 or, sorry, in 18 or uh, Kansas City's experience in 19 where they go on deep Champions League runs and they miss the playoffs. Um, and so we are going to need to do both, so, which is to say, <coughs> go for it, Champions League. We shouldn't be afraid because of that experience. 
um, we should go for it. But likewise, we're going to need more contributions, likely from younger players, if we are going to uh, navigate an MLS season while, while taking that on, knowing how much stress and pressure we're going to be under, literally starting in, you know, two, a little bit over, uh, I guess a little bit under three months from now. Thinking of how tough it is to play Champions League, obviously you have exercise options on some players. Can you talk about some of the players you chose to exercise that option on, like Gustav and the land? Sure. Yeah, um, I, I probably will fail at remembering everybody off the top of my head, but um, you know, Gustav we thought was uh, a key contributor for us down the stretch. Thought he was immense in the playoffs. Look at this, got it right in front of me. Um, the uh, thank you. This is this team. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I appreciate there that. There you go. Uh, and Gustav, you know, it was if I, again, there's no reason not to be transparent, you guys. You know, we had thought that this year was probably Gustav's last year, um, and that's what we had talked about a year ago when when we resigned him. Uh, and Gustav came to us and, and uh, you know, look between us, I think probably his wife came to Gustav and said maybe we should think <laughs> about staying. Uh, but we'll see. I won't put, put it all on her. And Gustav came to me and said I'd like to stay. And we said, you know, we had always assumed you didn't want to stay. So if you want to, like, that's, that's, that's great. So it was pretty easy to wrap that one up. Um, uh, somebody like Jordi Delem, you know, I think is an unsung uh, hero for us, a real contributor for us, a guy who played critical minutes for us. I think, I think he played in every playoff game. Does that sound right? Could have had a feature in it, yeah. 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 So, so you know, somebody that we protected in the expansion draft. You know, so it's a player that we value, and um, you know, so this, that one was you know took about two seconds to decide on. Um, some of the other guys here, options we took. And while Abuana, uh is a good young player, a lot of very talented, uh, and I think we need, again he's one of these guys that we have to work on his development, and he has to be more consistent and things like that. So it's a two-way street, but we got to get more out of him, and and we think he's capable of it. Um, and most of the rest of the guys, I mean, uh, it, you know, I, I, We're under contract. yeah, yeah, most of these guys are come back around a contract. Uh, the other guy we, whose option we took was Brian Meredith, uh, and obviously he's uh, he's now in Miami. So um, just want to say, take a minute to say thank you to Brian. Uh, you know, if you want to talk about blue guy, a guy who was awesome in the locker room. He was amazing with defiance, um, and that's something that maybe not all of you see, but 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 we see and I see. Uh, and he was such a good mentor to those kids and the way he helped them uh, in that. You know, we, we had, you can have veteran guys in that situation that have some resistance to going down. And, you know, I'm not a, a minor league player. I'm not a second team player. I don't want to be here. And Brian was the complete opposite of that. And he was invaluable to us as an organization. Um, so I just uh, want to say a big hearty thank you to, to Brian. And at the same time, I'm super excited for him because I think it's a, it's a new opportunity for him. And he just hasn't had a time to get a lot of minutes behind uh, a goalkeeper the level of Steph Fry. And now I think he'll get that opportunity in Miami. So, so really happy for him, too. With that said, though, his decline contracts, one of them that comes to mind is Roman Torres. And the way I Nico, are you sure that that was one on top of your mind? <laughs> 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 I'm, so, I'm, I'm so surprised at that. I appreciate it. Well, with you see coming up, he's a player who has certain respect from 100%. the area, the location. Yep. Uh, so how, how is that going? When he I, going hear he's, I hear he's done okay in some big games for us, too. Is that what he's doing? Right. Yeah, played a couple finals. He, he was, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I, I'm joking because uh, I, I messaged with his agent this morning, um, and he's probably my first call as soon as we get done with y'all today. So, um, you know, for a bunch of these guys, I'm, you know, without going individual, because all the situations are a little different, um, you know, there's a couple of those guys that we definitely are looking to come back. And so when we decline an option, all we're saying is we're not willing to pay this price that's on paper, but uh, there may be a mutually agreeable price upon which we can agree and, and uh, would, would, uh, would welcome you back. And it's, it's a tricky year for us because the CBA is expiring, uh, and so we don't know the salary cap. And so that makes for some interesting conversations this time of year, but we're, you know, we're going through our, it's kind of like a progression for a quarterback. You kind of, you got this, you got to take care of this and then this and then this and then this, and you have, you know, 10 conversations with 10 people and you see which one falls into place and you know uh, Brian and I sat together yesterday for a couple hours and you know the picture he has is literally our board our depth chart for you know for next year and there's some red lines indicating some open spaces that we got to fill on there and um, you know some suggestions about how to do that but that's you know that's that's where we'll occupy our time uh, in particular between now and Christmas because we really want to try to get everything done before then knowing that January 11 we start you know it's a very early start in terms of coming back for for Champions League. So it's fair to say that team will try to negotiate with Roman and want, want, want him back. 
look, yes, at some, at, but at some number, right? I mean, it, it, it's, you know, it, this, this is what I mean. We, we've said we don't want him back at this number. So is there a number upon which we can mutually agree? So, I, you know, it's, it's not so black and white as there's this and this and this. And in a salary cap world, you know, there are things I like. There are things that Coach Schmetzer likes. But the job is, my job is to put everything together. It's a jigsaw puzzle, right? And if you, this piece is a little bit bigger, then this one has to be a little bit smaller. And, and you know, it, it's prioritizing that and trying to come out with the best team that we can possibly build. Just to review the, the option pickups, you know, we talked about Justin Dillon, but he was picked up today. Can you talk about his performance on the year and kind of what you saw from him that said that he should be back on the MLS roster? Yeah, thanks for raising that, uh, Dave. I appreciate that because we should mention Justin. I mean, he's a guy that get, scored a ton of goals for Defiance. And again, we talk all the time about our pathway. This is a guy that was very successful uh, down at Tacoma uh, and I think earned his chance, you know, and, and didn't play big minutes for us, but played important minutes for us, you know, in games that we, that we needed points from. You know, he helped us uh, uh, beat Vancouver uh, as one example, you know, so when Brian and I did this in some of our exit meetings, you know, we, we talked about, you know, some of these guys that maybe didn't play big minutes, maybe aren't glamorous players, you know, could we identify and highlight a game or a moment where those people were still important to us and just in terms of speaking to them and, uh, you know, making everybody feel part of the championship and, and Justin certainly was part of that and I think he earned the right to come back and, um, you know, again, he's a He's maybe not a young player in the in the literal sense, but he's a you know he's an up and coming and experienced player, and, and we'll see you know what role he has long term. Uh, he's still got a lot to prove, but I do think he earned the right to come back. Is there any status update or uh, any information on Justin? Let, let me let me turn it over to Brian to speak about Justin real quick. Just there. just one last thing, because Dave, your your question's a good one, and and for all of the players on the team, because I think it was a team championship. It's a team sport. And in Justin's case, you know, I go back to that game in Columbus where we were depleted. We didn't have a ton of players. You know, Nico scores that goal. We beat my good friend Caleb Porter, which was pretty good for me. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, he made a contribution there. The flick on, Nico goes. I mean, those little contributions you might not think are a lot, but that's three points that helped us get the second. So well done to Justin and all the guys that helped us out during those lean months of the summer. Uh, Victor, uh, go ahead. Let, yeah, let's get started. Is there any uh, status update or new information on Brad Smith and where does that situation look like? No, there, there's no update on Brad and, and there won't be. You know, he's under contract to Bournemouth. Um, he's under contract to them until next summer. You know, so he's literally their player and, and we, you know, we cannot discuss him publicly. Um, you know, he's, he's under contract MLS through December 31st in terms of being on loan, but then that loan ends and he becomes a Bournemouth player and it'll be up to them to determine, you know, what his, what his future is. And, and, you know, once that is determined, if there's anything for us to talk about, we will. And, um, but it's, it's up to them and it's up to Brad, obviously, as to how he sees his career and where he wants to go going forward. Uh, Victor Rodriguez is another player uh, whose contract he declined. Uh, he obviously had a big impact in the uh, in the playoffs. Uh, can you speak to whether you think it's likely he'll return? Has he informed the team about his plans? Uh, does he want to return? Um, and just your general thoughts on his his end of the season. With Victor, you're yeah. asking. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me let me finish the one last thought on Brad before I switch there. Uh, we protected Brad, right? And you're, you're kind of like, well, if you don't have any control over what's happening, why would you protect him? Um, and the reason we have is we think he's a player that's that's going to have value in MLS. So if you think about what we did with Jovan Jones going back uh, two years to the LAFC expansion draft, we thought even though we knew we were going to lose Jovan, Jovan had already signed with Darmstadt at that point. Um, you know, so not dissimilar to Brad being under contract to Bournemouth, but we thought that he might come back to the league at some point. And, and you know, Brad's 25 years old, so whether it's next year or five years from now. I do think he had a positive experience. He really liked our coaching staff. He really liked playing in Seattle. Things like that that lead us to believe that maybe those holding on to those rights is something that might be of value to us long term. So that sort of pivot to Victor. Um, you know, I think uh, some of your colleagues, uh, uh, Matt, I know for sure, but uh, some of you guys have written about the family situation a little bit, and you know that's obviously up to Victor what he wants to share and what he doesn't. Um, but uh, from a personal standpoint, we need to do the right thing for his family. Um, and, you know, that is what we're focused on. And, and if he gets a resolution for him that is best for his family, that's what we're going to do. Um, do we love Victor? Absolutely. There is no, you know, I think Brian may have said this, uh, or I said it to somebody, anyway, I read it somewhere that 
one of us was quoted as saying, you know, you couldn't possibly be happier for any person than Victor to have come into that game and to have won the title and to have been named the MVP, given what he has been through in the last, you know, two years. So uh, he is a, a wonderful human being. He worked his tail off when many other players, I mean, he got hurt, you know, half a dozen times. And every time he made a step forward, he too would take a step back. And for him to persevere through that and to come good in the end and to then come off the bench when he's never come off the bench in his career and be the difference maker and the fight. Like, I, I, I can't possibly say enough good things about him. Um, but we need to be first and foremost focused on what's good for him and his family. Guys, you mentioned uh, MLS expansion. But I, I want, yeah, please don't let me hog all this time. No, no. <laughs> um, you mentioned expansion. The, 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 I guess the knock on that is that it waters down the players, the younger players. What, what have you seen in terms of the league and how it will kind of um, deal with that kind of, kind of uh, I guess, spinning? If, if it's yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with that comment, but what I look at it as is opportunity. Because, look, sometimes when we say the league – gets watered down, there's more teams, more roster spots, where do these players come from? Well, they'll come from down here. So it's it's an opportunity for young, and, and on a national level, not just on our level, you talk, you know, there's so much talk about, you know, the U.S. national team, development, you know, how do we best develop, there's, there's clubs from overseas coming to this country to take our talent, there's the, the, the Mexico-USA war between, you know, players that can play for both national teams. I mean, it's a really bigger conversation, but I actually look at it as an opportunity. We won't know until we put Danny Lave on the field a few more times. We won't know until Campo Chavez gets a couple of more opportunities whether there's holes in our roster or whether it's just, okay, it just gives them the chance to shine. So, uh, yeah, you, you might get it from some mid-range guys, you know, if, if the Harry Ships and some of the guys that have done a really good job for us maybe are, Brian you know, Meredith. taken apart. Brian Meredith, yes, I agree with you there. But, again, I think it's just an opportunity. You talk about those young guys, Trey Mew is another one, with Brian Meredith heading to Miami now. I want to get your thoughts on Trey Mew's season this year, his progression, and where you want to see him go in 2020 in terms of maybe being the Vines or appearing in the 18 more with the uh, Stephen Fry as backup. Yeah, we take uh, this one. Well, I can take the soccer part of it because, look, Tommy – I, I, I said this last night on Softy's show. I mean, I got to stop talking about Tom Dutra being such a good goalkeeper coach because they're taking all of our goalies, right? <laughs> so, so for Trey, I know he's going to develop, but the kid's still young. I mean, we can't push Trey too much in the spotlight if he's not ready. Once he's ready, he's going to get his chance. That's that's the way Tommy is. He's fair. You know how we how we bridge the gap between Steph and Trey and what do we do in between? Is it a, a MLS veteran type of guy in the middle and Trey's development? Trey got better. From when we first got him to the end of this season, he got better. The games down at Defiance were really good for Trey. There was, you know, that one save sequence that he had was, was really fantastic. So he will get better, but let's let's pump the brakes there a little bit. Let's not anoint him into the 18 yet. That's a little bit of pressure I want to take off the kid. Yeah, absolutely. And just to add to this, I mean, look at what we've done in the past, right? When we've, we've had Steph here, right? We had Troy Perkins, then we had Brian Meredith. So we, you know, historically, we've had a, a guy with some experience in that second role. The second dynamic that we're looking at going into the season is we played uh, 39 games this year. So we, we unfortunately went out in the first round of the Open Cup. Um, played four playoff games, had 34 regular season games. By comparison, uh, Atlanta played 47 or 48 games uh, between Campeones Cup and Champions League, and they won the Open Cup, and they won on a deep playoff run. And so, you know, to the to the question, we, you know, we are going to play more games, you know, with certainty. Uh, and, again, we had the oldest roster in the league last year. So let's be honest about that and open about it and say, okay, uh, I don't know if Steph Fry is going to play 44 times for us next year. Um, and so we need somebody who's going to be able to step in that role and, 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 and have probably some experience. So I think we will target that role. And then I think you have Trey in your role as, as your young, talented kid. And like a lot of our young, talented kids, like he'll, he's going to get an opportunity, you know, uh, out of necessity, if nothing else. And it's, then it comes down to them and how they handle it and how they, do with, how, how they deal with it. Um, you know, the, the last thing I'd, I'd add on this one is, We've been thinking a lot about this in our development project, and you know we kind of feel like we got it right up to the cusp. But now we got it. We now we got to 
take the final step and really link it and push these guys into the first team and, and really, you know, so our fans can see it week in, week out. Um, and I do think that there are positions like goalkeeper and like center back that take longer that you know you can still identify the right players at as teenagers you know at 17 18 19 years old but i do think that those experience those positions i can certainly speak to goalkeeper from experience they're so cerebral and so focused on how how many times you've done something and how many well you read the game and where you position yourself that in those spots we may need to be a little bit more patient in terms of how we bring guys along and again if, if somebody's ready we're certainly not going to stop them but i you know i look at somebody like justin glad uh, that I signed uh, at Salt Lake when he was 17 years old. And his numbers this year in year five at age 22 were unbelievable. They were off the charts. Um, but that was something that took, a, took some time and took some progression. And, um, you know, we'll have to see how these things go. You talked about getting younger. Uh, eight of the 18 on, the, on your current roster came through either the academy or the defined system. Um, how important is that? In getting younger. I certainly, I know coaches reference it already. I mean, certainly that's the plan. You know, is to, is to, you know, recruit and train and develop young players and have them be pushed into the first team and contribute. Um, you know, long term, if you look at the structure of our roster, we obviously have our DP guys, our match winners, the guys that, that win us titles, and you have your TAM guys, which is for us made up the the backbone of the team and really been you know the water carriers. Um, and to be clear, some elite players in that group as well, um, but certainly guys that have had a ton of success. And then you're going to have younger guys, and I do think that's how you balance it. Now, I, I, as with everything, it's not black and white, you know. And and you know, even if you look at where the oldest roster by average age, right, even that can be misleading, right? Because what you care about is your age in certain positions and their physical outputs, and you need the wide guys to run more than the central guys. So, if you're a little older in the middle, then that doesn't matter than uh, relative to how old you are out wide. And, you know, what, what matters the most for the young guys is are they going to work hard and are they good? You know, and, and I think they're talented. You know, we've put, just put three kids in the under-17 World Cup cycle. Um, but, you know, now it's, they're going to get the opportunity. It's up to them to, to prove it. I'm going to oh. take, take a follow-up to your question because it helps him, salary cap-wise, if some of our homegrowns come through. So, I mean, that might change because of the new CBA. But... You know, you, you get a little bit of benefit there if we can get our own young, homegrown players up. Helps us spend money more wisely. Ongar, um, speaking of our Champions League, uh, I heard comment that uh, the next step for the Sounders, for the success of the uh, organization is to get to the Champions League or be the first team of winning the Champions. So how to deal with this schedule? You know, that now it's a short schedule play, you have more time. But at the same time, the other leagues in, in, in the CONCACAF, when you guys come in, they already have the season. Or This problem has been happening, you know, always. But how seriously is the league or the club uh, trying to change that schedule so you guys can compete against those teams in kind of a fair way? Yeah, obviously CONCACAF controls the schedule, right? So, I mean, that, that's, that's not up to us. That's the governing body of the entire region, and they set a calendar that works for everybody and not just MLS. Certainly we have conversations with those folks, and not, not we, but the, the league does, MLS does, um, you know, to try to find that accommodation, that perfect uh, spot. Uh, I would tell you from my 12 years of experience, there is no perfect spot. You know, if you, if you move it later, then it disadvantages somebody else, and... Um, you know, I think everybody's invested in trying to have a good competition. So we are going to prepare our guys as best we can. The good news is we've been through this. Brian's been in charge of a Champions League team already. Uh, and, you know, we will be as prepared as we can be. You know, as I said, is it really difficult? Yeah, it's, it's really difficult. That's why no one's ever won it before. But that's also why it's a heck of a thing to try and do. I mean, that's, that's what we're here for, right? I mean, that's, I don't think a lot of people thought when, when we hired Brian in 2016 that we were going to make three finals in four years and win two titles. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to do our best. When you have a successful franchise, you have successful players, uh, there comes interest from other teams. Uh, it is my understanding that uh, Monterey is owner group ship, as well as Cruz Azul, very interested in Nicolas Rivera. This is uh, information that I've gathered that they've started the communication process at some facility in their own groups. Have you received any type of uh, call or opportunity from either Monterey or Cruz Azul? 
I would say I'll answer this question the way I have for four years. Uh, the good news is we have really good players. The bad news is when you have really good players, everybody wants them. Uh, and we've had consistent interest from Mexican clubs, not just those two, uh, for years. And Nico, and uh, when I met with Nico at the end of the season, he said he wanted to be in Seattle and play for the Sounders, and you know that's good enough for me. So. Yeah, but he obviously was a big part of our franchise, the launch of the franchise. Um, you know, I reflect back on Ziggy a lot. I mean, we, we uh, you know, it could be a random thought, oh, Zig used to like that restaurant, or, you know, we used to go there and hang out with him, me and Tommy, and stuff like that. So he, he creeps up into my thoughts often. Um, certainly he would have been proud of, proud of everything that we've accomplished. Uh, you know, he was a supporter of mine. Um, even in a, in, a, in a difficult situation when he got fired, I still remember this story. So when he did get fired, he, he handed me the, okay, this is, was the lineup I was going to play on the weekend. And he was supportive of me taking over. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure he's smiling on us, for sure. When you look at this offseason, uh, you look at the roster, there appear to be some potential holes in that you only have one center back on the roster, you're going to be missing a, a wide player that was your MLS Cup MVP. What are the priorities going into uh, this offseason? And uh, you, you mentioned Torres. Uh, you, you didn't mention, or maybe you're not going with Kim, but also you, know, you, you don't have the luxury of time to wait on Rodriguez's status, I suppose. The, the good news is, though, is we have an internal solution to the Victor thing. Uh, obviously, when we went on the, the, the run the year before, Christian Roldan played a bunch at right wing, and we've used him at right wing this year, um, and he's played right wing for the national team. So, um, you know, we look at that as an option. And so, you know, to your point, is I don't think we're going to get stuck on that one. You know, we have a good solution. Um, and, you know, if you look at the group of defensive midfielders, then if you pull Christian out of the middle and you look at Aleva, you look at a Spence and you look at a Dilem, those are th three players that we're really happy with and, and think have a lot of potential. And, you know, so uh, we obviously need more than one center back. There's, that's, you know, that's math. Um, you know, and again, we're talking to Roman, we're talking to Kim. You know, I, I think there's still something that could happen there. We'll see. Um, you know, we're. Chris and Sean, our, our, our top scouts, are, are out identifying talent, really traveling the world right now as we speak. So they'll bring us back some good options there. Um, I do think you could see us reinforce defensive midfield in the long term. Uh, you know, so you may see something there. But I, I, I would say that, that in really, really simple terms, Jeremiah, <clears throat> in general, we feel pretty good about our attack. I mean, we average three goals a game in the playoffs. I think it's the most goals in terms of uh, total output per game of any ch and a MLS Cup champion. Um, and we felt like we had a really effective way of playing, uh, particularly toward the end. Uh, and our defense, it wasn't that it was good or bad. We gave a couple more goals, but the expected goals actually wasn't that different than the year before. Um, but what we had was instability. And we had center back rotations, and we had defensive midfielder rotations, and we had different outside backs. and. I think what we're going to look to try to get to is a little bit more stability in those roles. And certainly we need to look at our depth in those roles uh, and really try to establish and nail down. Uh, because if you look at, yeah, so we, we, yes, we could have some potential holes to fill. To state the obvious, if fewer guys come back, we have more holes to fill. Um, but the good news is for these guys that aren't coming back, they're all on big numbers. You know, Victor over a million dollars. Uh, Roman was on a big number. Kim's on a big number. Um, so we do have the resource. When I, I share that, just because then we have that means we have the resources to replace those players if they if they uh, if they don't come back to us. Uh, Emmanuel Cicchini is a player who had a little trouble getting into the lineup, uh, and obviously you just did the rundown of uh, defensive midfielders that you could uh, swing in. I was curious as to uh, from Coach Metzer, uh, did you see what you wanted to see from him? Is there something else you were looking for to get him in the lineup and? and uh, just his status with the team uh, going into 2020. He was on that loan throughout the, the rest of the year. Is that correct? Contractually, yes. He is under contract to us as part of the, the, the loan agreement that we signed last year. Yes. So his the, uh, the soccer part of Emmanuel was, look, the kid came in just at the wrong time. It, it, the timing just wasn't there. I mean, the team was in a little bit of flux. You know, we, we hadn't settled in on a, on a, on a real lineup. 
if you look at our seasons, uh, you know, since I've taken over, you know, the, the thing that we always had was a little bit of consistency towards the end of the year. It wasn't quite there. Um, Emmanuel was a nice player. He never stopped working. Uh, even when I had to tell him that, you know, he, he didn't even make the 18, he continued to work. He understood that, you know, this was for the good of the team, for the good of the group, raising the standard of the training. I don't have any negative things to say about Emmanuel. It was just, I think, the wrong place, wrong time. And how we solve that, push that forward in the future, you know, that'll be determined. Oh, coach, um, you're a local um, player, coach. You started your career down in the, uh, Green Lake in Golden Morning Field when you were young. And now you are, uh, you know, directing one of the top teams in the league. I would like to ask you, what would the um, youth system in the Washington State need to do to impact more to the um, the soccer, the Seattle Sounders uh, organization? Because um, seems to me, you know, ten years looks to be, looks to be a lot. They uh, you know have five years from five years ago to now. I would like to see how that youth system is working and how they what they need to do to improve. Well, I, I don't know if I have enough <clears throat> mental strength to take on the youth system in Washington State, <laughs> but but I obviously do have an opinion, and the opin opinion, again, revolves around this organization. I think this organization has done a good job of, of going out into the communities. You know, we have a, a large academy staff. We, we do a lot of things to try and, you know, connect with the other youth teams, the other youth players that are here. You know, obviously our academy has had a lot of success. So they're, they're, they're obviously doing something right. Uh, soccer is a big sport. I mean, yeah, you, you, you mentioned back some of the muddy fields and, you know, just a couple of teams here and there, individual, individual, you know, uh, uh, Lake City Hawks here, the Capitol Hill team here, the, you know, other teams like that. It's become, again, a growth sport in this country, not just at an MLS level, but certainly on the youth level as well. There's so many kids. If I want to give a shameless plug out to my brother, he's involved in TOCA. TOCA is a training platform that helps young players develop. You know, those types of opportunities weren't around when I was around. I mean, the, it, it's just a sign that people are willing to pay extra for extra training. Guys like Viet Nguyen, uh, Craig Tomlinson, former Sounders, they're out in the communities, Leighton O'Brien, they all do a good job coaching in the, in the youth systems. So there's that touch point from previous Sounder players that have stayed here. You know, Alan obviously is a big personality. He stayed here. Jimmy stayed here for a long time. So there's a lot of uh, synergy between the Seattle Sounders as an organization and all of the people that stay here and work here in the youth soccer system. What's the status of Damian Bowden's uh, replacement? Uh, we've We've, talk, we've talked to a bunch of people, uh, as you can imagine, during the season. We obviously we knew this was coming for a while. Um, I do think there's a potential internal solution there as well for us. So it's another one where we feel like we won't get stuck again, uh, but we're still talking to people. Um, don't have a timeline for resolving that, other than uh, I think Coach reminded me to the day how many days I have to uh, solve this for him ahead of January 11th. So uh, we'll get it done. Um, and, and the good news is, is that our uh, performance staff has a, an impeccable reputation as you know, uh, arguably the best in MLS and you know, one of the best in, in North America. So we get a lot of people that want to come and work for us. How has this, I'm, if I'm trying to remember what, how big that staff was when he was hired, is it? A considerably more robust staff than when, because I know when, when uh, Tommy left or when Dutra left, not Dutra, uh, Dave Tenney. Dave Tenney. I have to go to the whole time. When Dave Tenney left, it there was that obviously caused some some hiccups. Um, yep. What uh, like I, how how much more stable I suppose is the, the question is how much more stable is that department now than it was when when Dave yep. left. No, it's a good question, to Jeremiah, and a totally fair one, because we had issues with uh, Damien's visa, and so he physically wasn't present for part of preseason, and it did cause issues. Um, what I would say again is we, we at, you know, in that scenario, Chad Kalarsik, who was the number two to Dave Tenney, had gone and had accepted the head job uh, with Colorado Rapids, and so we were actually down two guys, and so part of the strain was we had Sean Muldoon doing literally everything for the department as one guy. That is not tenable. What we have now, though, is different. We have uh, four full-time people in that department, 
um, three of whom are, are Damien's gone, but uh, you know the other three are still here. Um, that has increased. Back when Dave Tenney ran the department, we actually had two full-time people, so we've added a third uh, to help us with our development stuff. But certainly, if you talk about staffing a preseason and having uh, a periodization in terms of preparation, um, I think we're well capable of, of handling that, and, and it gives us a, the ability to be a little bit more calm about how we go about it. And again, it's really trying to get a, the right long-term answer. I mean, it, we've, we've had really good stability in our player identification in Chris Henderson. We've had really good stability with, with our player development with Mark Nichols. Really good analytics with uh, Robbie. You know, folks have been here, and ideally, I think you know we had Dave Tenney here for a long time, and that's that's our preferred outcome again is to try to find somebody that can be here for a long time and look that's part of the reason culturally that we're looking at some of the people internally as well to say do we have some of this capability that's already here but Brian you want to add to that or well obviously it's a big part of you know the success of the franchise is getting a good performance department up and running I think you know Damien had lots of strengths and there were some other challenges and stuff like that but overall you know, the periodization plan and all that sort of stuff, you know, we learned a lot. You know, we as coaches learned a lot. And I think a lot of the stuff that Damien did uh, helped us. You know, he was able to impart some of that wisdom onto Sean, to Amber, to Hillary in the, in the, in the training department, Chris Cornish. So, you know, overall, we'll, we'll, we'll get it right. And I agree with Garth. I think, it, you know, the timing is right to, for us to get a long-term solution to that, that something, some, somebody that wants to grow with the organization. Garth, when, when you had the ability to come with, with Brian, with Chris, and the rest of the front office, you know, you got two championships in four years. You have this ability to create, to, to be considered a dynasty. How, how much did that play um, into not taking any other possibilities when opportunities start knocking at the door to go other clubs? So, you know, how much does it weigh the fact that you can continue to be here with the Sounders and continue to build this great success uh, aside from other opportunities and other clubs? Um, look, I, I think when you're good at your job, people will speculate about all kinds of things. So um, let me try to answer this question holistically. I, I mean, look, I, I'm, to the dynasty thing, I, we've won two titles in four years. It's not a dynasty for me. I, we have more to do. We're going to go try to win the Champions League. I think they're very clear and obvious uh, short and long-term goals, you know, can we be the first team, not just to make that run, but to set ourselves up now that playoff seeding matters to finish well in the league. And, you know, there's, there's always challenges here. So, um, but just to, just to kind of address this, cause I know there's been some stuff out there this week. Um, my family's really happy here. Um, my, my boys, I have three young boys and, and, uh, they went to get haircuts yesterday and my five-year-old Finn took with him a picture of Jordan Morris. And he said, I want to have my hair cut like this. So he came home and he's got Jordan Morris's haircut as best as could be approximated by someone cutting a child's hair on a uh, wooden donkey watching a, a, a cartoon. Um, the, uh, they do amazing things there to distract them. Uh, you know, my, my eight-year-old boy, Benny, has a soccer ball signed by Steph Fry, like, and it's his most prized possession in the world. So, you know, those are things that are, that are really important and will always be really important to me. Um, you know, with respect to the Chicago thing, just to tackle that head on, um, Nelson Rodriguez is my friend. Um, he's a guy who was a mentor to me when I was at the beginning of my career. Um, and it would be unethical and irresponsible of me to say anything to further any speculation uh, on that front. Um, Nelson's a good person. Uh, he does a great job there. Um, and, you know, that's, that's his thing. Um, you, know, you know, that said, Long term, at some point, would I love to run a club? As I said in the article with Grant Wall, yeah, yeah. I, I you know, I think any person who accomplishes a lot and is ambitious and wants to move forward and wants to continue to grow and continue to learn, and I think there's a lot of ways to do that here. You know, it it, it uh, it's not an absolute thing where I have to have such and such job or this description or whatever. But um, is it something that's interesting to continue to do more? Always, always. I mean, that's that's what that's what makes us all. Who we are. I mean, we, we want to. We won that second title. We want to go win Champions League. You know, you do something well. You want to do. You want to do something more. Something better. Garth, in um, speaking of the celebration, so compared with the first time, and, and you had an official in, in the bus that was uh, riding with you guys, like the mayor and some, some somebody from the team coming. 
So what do you think about the celebration this time, the day being the, uh, the round, the celebration of the Seattle Center? I think it was awesome, man. I, I got to ride a bus with Russell Wilson, so that was kind of cool for me. Uh, and not, and take, take nothing away from the mayor, because I, I get to, I get to, I've been able to sp speak to her and do different things with her at different times. So, so uh, she was, she was always friendly, and you know that was that was fun to share that with her. Um, you know, but uh, when people are chanting MVP at your bus as you walk the parade route and stuff yeah. like that, it's can't say I've had that experience before. So that was kind of fun, and um, you know, Russell and, and his wife Sierra, they're you know very nice people, and so. Uh, that was a big part of our bus and, and you know, the, the but I mean the, the important bus, right, was the one in front, right, with the players and the cup and doing everything that, uh, you know, should be the focal point of that parade. Um, you know, we are rightfully, you know, behind the scenes, which is how we operate 99% uh, of the time. But to be out and share that moment with the community was awesome. Um, I'll, I'll diverge a little bit here and simply say that before the MLS Cup game, was the coolest sporting experience of my lifetime. To be out in Occidental Square with Macklemore performing with literally city blocks of people stacked up. Um, and this is something the coaching staff doesn't get to do. And I can't claim I've done the March of the Match very often, but you know, to be part of that crowd and be able to walk in front of that crowd and then to come upon the stadium and to be serenaded by people packing the concourses with a call and response with the masses of people. Like, it gives me chills right now, just, just remembering it. I was like, you walk into the building you think you're walking on clouds and the thing's packed and there's 70,000 people there and you know I think it's worth like what a moment what a moment in in any town's history but in this town you know that, that's waited so long for that moment for that occasion you know I can't imagine the pressure on the coaching staff and the players because I get to go in and just go sit down and watch the game and you know have a, have a bottle of water right these guys got to go actually perform under that so my hats off to them in that circumstance. You know, they came through and, and delivered in the in the biggest of all big moments. Um, and now we get to have a happy press conference because you know if they hadn't done an exemplary job, um, if they hadn't done an extraordinary thing and, and beaten LAFC, one of the, one of the best teams of all time from a regular season perspective, uh, you know, we're not here. We're not having this conversation. We're not having that moment. And to me, that was the the centerpiece, the pinnacle, again, greatest sporting event of my, of, that I've been a part of. Garth, looking at the Bryant season as a whole, there's some tough results at the beginning, but it seemed like they really came together at the end. They were getting big results. They were scoring a bunch of goals. Uh, from your perspective, what did you make of that progression and how, how, did, how that season ended? What are you feeling about their prospects for, for 2020? Um, it, it makes me cautiously optimistic. You know, I think the choice we had to make with Defiance before this season was we could either be too young or too old. Uh, what I mean by that is we could have we could have taken the, the difficult experience we had the year before and say you know what we need is more experienced players and we said we don't want to do that because we don't want to do anything to stifle the development of this class of young guys coming through and so we went too young knowing that with an average age of I think we were 18 and 19 most of the, most of the games we fielded Dave may know better than me um, you know that's still that's very young you know and ideally what comes back from that Ari is in year two of that cycle with that young group you have more success and look that's how is one example that's how we built the ga cup squad so we played a really young team and they won the lower division of that ga cup tournament and then we got our most experienced guys in year two and that's what allowed us to win the ga cup the most prestigious youth tournament in america in in year two and so i'm not saying we're going to win the championship next year and i'm going to be if anything more cautious with how i characterize the on-field success of that team, because I think I got ahead of myself in terms of some of the things I said. We were not ready to compete for the playoffs, and I do think we continue to evolve that group in terms of what, what is the balance between experienced players and young players, and I think the, the nuance that we've arrived at is certain positions matter more than others in terms of where you have experience down there and how those players can help the other players, and certainly we have to be thoughtful about how we replace a Brian Meredith as one example, who was uh, genuinely influential down there. Um, but so am I encouraged? I'm encouraged, but if you remember, we, we actually had a little uptick at the end of uh, the 2018 season as well. This one was a little bit more prolonged, it was a little bit more pronounced. Hopefully we got a little bit more tailwind out of it, um, but part of it is too um, having the same staff in place for next year, which I think will give us a little bit more stability. Um, yeah, I think it was, there was a little bit of bump at the beginning when we changed from, uh, from John Hutchinson, who had done an awesome job and got an incredible opportunity back in Australia. Uh, I think any team would be lucky to have 
uh, and then transitioning to Chris Little, who had you know, come to our academy and has proven himself also to be a, a good coach at that level. Let me, let, let me piggyback on top of Ari's question there because, again, from a coaching perspective, we just sat in with John this morning and he gave us his kind of review of his season and we were able to give him feedback as far as you know what we saw because you know we watch the games on TV or we go down to the stadium and so we gave him better feedback to be a better coach you know it's his first go around in the pro ranks you know roster makeup he talked about the interaction between defiance and the first team and how can we improve that how can we make that a little more streamlined because a lot of times you know we would say okay John look we need we need a player for you know we need a right back for today's training session because Kelvin wasn't going to train and it took one of his training plans and and we just took a player and he had to deal with it so we're talking about those types of ways to make the club organizationally stronger and I think that will help hopefully you know defiance being a little bit more consistent and Chris having a little bit better handle on what he can do on a daily basis as well and you both talked about guys like Levo, Campo Chavez, and Hughes but in terms of the other guys down in Tacoma, that looking ahead in 2020, you want to see keep getting better. Uh, you want to maybe you know go and challenge for a first team spot. What are some of those guys that you look at? And I don't want to put you know any too much pressure on those guys. I'm sure you guys don't as well. But but what are you looking at in terms of some names down there that that you want to see more of and, and make that next step in 2020? You know, I I think you know to what Coach Spencer said about Trey Muse. I, I don't know that we're going to set public expectations for these guys. Um, I do think that we have the talent within our system that we don't finish last in under 23 player minutes next year. And again, that, that's not a criticism where we are. I mean, that, that, that this is, we are in the infancy of this program. I mean, it, it is, yes, we are in year four, so in that sense, not in the infancy, but you know, we are just now approaching these kids getting old enough and, and uh, far enough along their pathway to start breaking into the first team. You know, when Jordan Morris broke in with the national team, he was 19. When Christian Roldan broke in with our team, he was 19. So. Danny and Fonz are 16 and 17. Um, and again, we, we did this intentionally. We said, can we jumpstart this and get them in two years earlier such that we can speed up their development? Um, but there's still reality and things like physical development and things that where their, their bodies are going to change and those kids are going to continue to grow and that's going to impact them. And what kind of, you know, these kids are still in high school. I mean, like, uh, they have to get through that and accomplish those kind of basic tasks and grow up. And so anyway, I, we are going to give them what, what I think we're committed to is we are going to give them every possible resource to help them succeed on the field, off the field, with their families, um, from a technical, from a video, from a, an emotional, like, uh, you know, uh, they're going to have opportunities and we're going to support them and we're going to try to push this thing forward together. Brian. When you took on this job, you know, as a candidate for the coach, I think that, you know, there's people that, to this day, you've been uh, proven wrong on, on, on whatever, what your expectations are, things like that. Now you have two cups. You're in a very elite group of coaches in MLS history who have two cups. Uh, how do you see your future with the team in regards to maybe continuing to build on that success and maybe getting an extension with the club for, for uh, a few more years and all of that? Well, I mean, look, it, it, you can leave the contract stuff out of it because this is really my dream job. I'd like to stay here for as long as I can. So whatever that is, however that is, you know, I'll let those people decide. As far as, again, I've said it before, I'm just a steward of the club. I know I'll get released at some point. I know I'll get fired or retire or whatever. I mean, that, that, that's an eventuality that all coaches have to have to figure on, right? So. What I would say is that I'm very proud of the success that we've had since we've taken over. Uh, I certainly have very talented people working for me. And you know, I don't just mean Gonzo, Jimmy, Precky, and, and Tommy, but I mean all the staff down here, the performance staff, the physios, all of that sort of stuff. They all support the club. The guys in the equipment room, I mean, we, we have a really good organization here. So I'm actually lucky that I can work in a, in a, in a you know, sometimes it's pressure. I mean, sometimes there's pressure, but that's pro sports, but it's really a good pressure because we all push each other to be the best that we can. Not all the time we're going to see each other, see things the same way, but I don't, think that's, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's actually healthy. I don't want my coaches to always agree with me. I don't think that, you know, that's healthy 
I think we need to have different opinions so that I can make better coaching choices. You know, when we talk about players, I don't want us to always think, okay, the same way as Garth. I think we need to give him different viewpoints, different ideas. How do we make the roster stronger? And then he's got to make the decisions. So that that's what I think. So I'm very lucky to be in this organization and happy to keep going for a few more years, Nico. I know your experience <laughs> will reflect that attention of yourself, but in, in terms of, you know, You've always said that you don't need to look for anybody's perspective, but you go for perspective of who you care about, and that's my what dog. matters. But now with two cubs, <laughs> who all those doubters, all those people that maybe didn't think you'd be here, I mean, then you feel a little bit of an edge, or, you know, I don't know. Um, look, I am a hate-to-lose type of, type of guy. You know, I, I, I hate losing. And sometimes you can say that hatred is, a, is the wrong emotion, you got to love winning and all that sort of stuff. It, it, people are cut different ways, right? A lot of times when I ask young players, what are you? Do you are you the guy that you know, loves the euphoria of winning or scoring the winning goal, or are you the guy that really hates to lose? And usually the attackers are the guys that like, love to win, the defenders are the guys that hate to lose. You know, I was a defender, more defensive-minded guy in my earlier career, maybe that's the way I am. Um, I, I just, I just think I don't carry a chip on my shoulder because it's not my nature, but it certainly does feel good when I can sit up here and you know there's two trophies over there. I, I'm pretty proud of that too. You know, we ask you, Brian, a lot about what you imagined walking into CenturyLink would be <laughs> on MLS Cup. Um, yeah. What was it? What was it actually like for you? I mean, was there, was there, did you, like, were you so focused on the game you didn't give yourself a chance to think about that? No, I think Gar said it best when he was explaining the march of the match because, you know, he, he, I loved his answer. I was a little more focused on the game. I mean, me and Tommy always walk out together, a cup of coffee, whatever. We always look at the crowd and all that sort of stuff. But I loved the emotion in, in Gar's story. I was a little bit more focused on the, on the team. And I think somebody mentioned in an earlier question about the pressure of, of that game. There was. I mean, there was, there was pressure there. And I think the team played like there was a little bit of pressure. And I have to reflect back on myself. Did I emit, <clears throat> you know, some of that pressure onto the players? Was I able to kind of make them relax prior to kickoff? So there was a lot of things going on in my mind. As I reflected back on the game and, you know, I rewatched the game and, you know, Obviously, I pay attention on social media and, and look back on all the cool storylines that were happening during the course of that game. Yeah, I, I, I can say now it was a really super event, but in that moment, I was focused. A few seconds ago, you talked about the turnover and how one day you won't be the head coach of the Sounders down the road. And, and you also talked in the past weeks about the consistency of the staff here, from all the way from Garth to Chris to, to Sean and your coaching staff as well. Does it surprise you guys at all to add about from how much success that you've had over the last four years that you've been able to keep that group together for the most part? Nobody has gone off to take another coaching job, whether it be Gottenzo, whether it be Chris taking another GM job. Has it surprised you at all that you've been able to keep that consistency with your group here? Well, look, at some point that's going to happen too. I mean, that's reality. You know, people are going to get opportunities to go do and if they feel it's the right project or the right thing I, I'm sure they would go but I, I'm just happy that they feel like our organization is a forward-thinking you know really good organization to work for and you know that plays a part the city of Seattle my hometown I mean there's a lot of special things that go on here in the Pacific Northwest that makes it an attractive place to live uh, Chicago's a great city. Uh, I love Chicago. I love going to visit. And, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a draw for some people. But other people like the city of Seattle when they come here. That's why a lot of the players throughout <coughs> 70s, 80s, 90s now stay here. And they make homes here in Seattle. Uh, just the first offseason since uh, MLS obviously revamped the schedule and the playoffs. I'm just wondering, just kind of generally, how, how you think that's going to go between now and the start of the season, which we believe is uh, February 29th. Does that give you enough time to prepare for everything you want to do? Is it too long uh, as far as an off season for players who, who are now off? Just curious both of your thoughts kind of operationally and uh, from the coaching side. Coaching side, I can talk about that first. I mean, I, I was talking to Ezra. Who you know who is in Columbus and they didn't make the playoffs and they were struggling to you know 
train the team, and it's a long break for teams that didn't make the playoffs. That that's, that's way too long. You know, I think uh, uh, Mark DeSantos uh, up in up in Vancouver complained about the the length of the off season and all that sort of stuff. I mean, I, I I feel for those guys. You know, if your team didn't make the playoffs or you didn't play until November 10th, that that's a long time off. Uh, Sean Muldoon, our sports people there, they are working on off-season training plans. There's certainly the contractual CBA agreements that I'll let Garth talk about, but yeah, there is some concern about how do we dial in, you know, is it too long, is it too short, you know, with this December 10th being an MLS Cup, that was really too short. But now is it too long? I, I, I don't know yet. Yeah, and I would I would say I think in particular you know we felt it when we were in back to back finals for that December ten date yeah, that, that, that that the cum by year three, I think it was part of the reason that we lost to Portland last year was it just I mean I remember the, the exit interviews where we had you know we talked about it you know really veteran guys saying I'm tired like I need to I need to shut down so I do think longer than six weeks is is good. Um, you know talking to some of my colleagues around the league you know if your team missed the playoffs, I think. You know that's something that has to be thought about and programmed, and you know holistically, how do you do that going forward? Whether that's off-season training or you know things that maybe get addressed in the CBA. Uh, for our club specifically, I think I think it's about the right amount of time. Uh, you know, without knowing what I'm talking about uh, in details and how it's going to play out in preseason and all that stuff, but we have enough time to get done what we need to get done. It was, you know, we got to, for the first time we uh, Brian and I didn't have to cut anybody before the parade. I know we both appreciated that. The guys appreciated that. You know, we, we, it was a, a more extended timeline where we got to enjoy the moment for a second and get up on stage and have a rally. And then, you know, yeah, had, had to have some hard meetings the next day, but it's a heck of a lot better than doing it in the hotel lobby, you know, after you walked off the field 12 hours before. Um, so, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to. No, 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 that's, I agree. I mean, those were, those were terrible meetings to have. Brutal. Brutal. So. So, so I, I think we'll learn more, Mickey, you know, and I think we're still figuring out this, this footprint. And, you know, look, the League's Cup has expanded, right? Uh, Campione's Cup was a huge event in its first uh, iteration, sorry, second iteration in Atlanta. Um, I think that'll be a huge event here in Seattle. Uh, and, you know, Champions League, it, it, it's, you know, that's growing on, on a yearly basis as well. So I, I think the, the, the burdens, the weights become greater every year. And it's a question about, how you manage that, and I think that's you know that's a lot of the, the kind of skill and the nuance that we have to continue to try to get better on. I don't think you the Sounders have ever signed another team's free agent, um, but obviously as we get deeper into this process, there are more attractive players potentially that uh, enter free agency. Is it, do you look at the pool of free agents and, and see potentially players that you're going to be uh, recruiting or going after? Yeah, I mean, one of the other things that's changed, right, is, is not everybody's done their, their option decline uh, accept uh, memo yet, right? Because uh, the deadline for that on the CBA is December 1st. So when we played the Cup, we had to push all this out together, right? Protected list, option declined, and you had to prepare for this. But in this year, uh, uh, Jeremiah, uh, on Friday, we get those lists. So we get the, the official legal lists of, hey, here's who we think is available. So um, we can speculate on some of that, but it's probably more productive to look at, you know, A, who, as an example, I think I think technically the free agency list we don't get right, I think that's another week, but the re-entry draft is early next week, that'll be our first, and we will get that list, the re-entry list, on Friday, um, and I think between the unprotected group of players and the re-entry group of players, you'll start to get a better feel of, you know, what, who is available and who is not, and at what cost, and, you know, that's the process that, that the front office is going through right now, is trying to assess those marketplaces. Yeah, no, look, it, it's been amazing. Uh, the, the outpouring of support uh, in terms of selling out the building was incredible. Um, from what I understand, we sold more season tickets uh, the week of MLS Cup and the week after than we had in, in the previous year or previous season or something like that. And I'm probably not exactly get those numbers right but there's been an incredible outpouring of support from the community not just for that game but people saying hey that was a memory that i will cherish forever and i want to be there again and and it's been literally the last two weeks have been the hottest season ticket weeks uh it, i certainly say unequivocally in a long long time and and you know people really want to be part of this and that's been really gratifying that we were part of this special event 
and you know when I talked about having chills being in the building it sounds like some other people got some chills uh, as well and want to come back so uh, it, it's hosting at home was we, we thought would be a, an incredible opportunity and, and I think it's proven that on the business side as well as on the soccer side.